I was requested to respond on Sam Cedar on his take on Milton Friedman. He watches a wee part of the video to do with the greed and then he hits out with this. What is the outcome here? I can name a lot of things that are born out of government uh, programs. INTERNET! Whilst it is true to say that the government invented the intranet, it was used for the military and it was inefficient. Had it not been for the market, it would not have been made accessible to the wider market, to that of the consumer. In other words, it was the market that made it accessible, that basically made it efficient. He then laughably says this. You know how, ma you know how far Ford would have gotten? with uh, making all his cars if there wasn't a government to create roads? Not very far, because he would run into trees and into hills, I guess. This illustrates that he doesn't even understand American history because when it was left out in the market between 1794 to 1845 in the private turnpike industry, roads were built and successfully completed. The roads met the consumer's demand. Things were running at a profit with the private turnpike companies that were operating on them, keeping them in good condition. Whereas when government intervened through the internal improvements, which is the corporate subsidies, the roads were left unfinished, roads were built to meet government's own self-interest right through people's private farmland without their consent, and furthermore, it eventually led to that of bankruptcy, just like the internal improvements did. Railroad industry, the steamship industry, etc, etc. And for some strange reason, he seems to think that if it wasn't for government, you wouldn't have these roads. Like I've pointed out many times before, New York saw 4,000 miles of turnpike successfully built and completed, and $11 million worth invested into it. What was $11 million worth in those days? Given the fact of $65,000 nine. 1911 was worth an absolute bomb. Just imagine what 11 million dollars was worth. As if to say that if, if it wasn't for government and if it wasn't for their taxation, you wouldn't have any roads. Utter pish folk. It's folk like him who don't even understand a hang to a totty day with American history. Here's the thing that, that sort of baffles me as to what that, that clip was supposed to do. Yes, I have no doubt that there is greed in every system. I don't think it's the case that uh, greed has pushed every uh, system of, of development. So this argument on greed is just stupid and of course based on the self-interest because it's something part and parcel of human nature and of course it contradicts socialism as I've argued before. In Robert P. Murphy's book Choice, Cooperation, Human Action, which is based on Ludwig von Mises original book Human Action, he basically argues that Mises talks about this to do with the social cooperation and following their own self-interest and this is what creates an harmonious society, society as such individuals being able to pursue their own self-interest and whatnot whereas the very societies that led in the opposite direction of that have led in nothing but conflict etc which is the very reason why you've seen wars stem from you know these type of systems that have led in such economic catastrophe you could take for example how the rise of Nazi Germany came from the fall of the Weimar Republic etc. So it's more than what you know Milton Friedman's arguing where Milton Friedman is absolutely right in what he says. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worse, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. You only have to look at that of the Soviet Union. Perhaps more so in the past 150 some odd years, 200 years, where you could actually amass more capital than you could carry on your back. Well, and there's also the other thing too, is he was saying that it's only in society. I mean, I, speaking in the 70s, I think that clip is maybe the 80s. We know the outcomes of what societies have in terms of best outcomes on health and well-being and, and, and things like that. And those are always more these boring socialistic than social us. mixed market systems right. like in Western Europe. That's where you have the highest life expectancies, best education levels. So folk, he's basically trying to argue that these Scandinavian economies, the social market economies, that he doesn't even understand. He's trying to say that socialism somehow had the benefit. But that's no why they became so productive, etc. And socialism has actually been a detriment to their economy through the higher tax rates. It's actually been the very reason why they've got a severe 
their lack of productivity in their domestic economy. It goes back to that whole thing that the reason why there's been so much mere productivity over the last 200 years or whatever because of capitalism to that extent even within the mixed economy is simply because of the, again, the argument on the division of labour and something you could look at is comparative advantage. Division of labour meant that individuals could pursue what they specialise in, what they're best at and not trying to do too many things at the one time, then of course they're able to, you know, produce a lot more simply because they're concentrating on the one thing. If individuals were to isolate themselves through self-sufficiency apparently, they were to go down the road of trying to do too many things at the one time, they wouldn't really get much done because it's too much to honour, it's too much for them to take on, less would be produced. The current population today would never or sustain that sort of self-sufficiency simply because most of them would starve to death. Whereas the benefit of this whole division of labour, farmers could concentrate solely on what they do and that meant that other people could concentrate on what they do, could not hold and exist without this of the ability to freely trade with one another. So for example, the farmer, you know, producing the food, being able to benefit for others who may specialise in clothes and stuff like that and so much more gets produced and there's so much more of those goods and services that's accessible to the masses and that was all because of the division of labour. That all goes down to this whole thing of, of something called comparative advantage. A particular individual for whatever reason being might be so gifted, might be so talented in a, a variety of different things and just so much better than the, their other workers. However, for the benefit of them, since there's too much today and there's so much jobs to take on, that individual will still benefit for taking on uh, a labour may not have the same skills, but because of that individual being able to free up the space and time for this person to concentrate on what they do best, they'll gain more money for it. And this was something of an example that Bob Murphy gave. Bob Murphy gives the example of this in Choice Cooperation and Human Action, and he mentions about the example. Now, the table 5.1, which you can see here, that Marcia just happens to be a lot more productive than that of the other individual, John, that, that has been hired. What Bob Murphy goes on to explain on comparative advantage and just to quote what he says, if Marcia is running her business in a monetary economy it is quite simple for her to figure out whether it makes sense to hire outside help or to close the store early so that she can tidy up herself. For example, suppose that the typical customer purchase yields Marcia net earnings of $20. That means for every 15 minutes that Marcia devotes to helping customers on the floor, on average she brings in an extra $20 that she can pay her Herself. If Marcia has to kick the customers out early so that she can spend the last 30 minutes of each day tidying up on average, she thereby loses out on $40 in potential income from her business. So this is the point folk, this is what's been able to sustain such a large population for society to become so much more productive and improve the living standards of the masses. You could use the example, you know, when you look at socialism with the communal ownership of property, just look what happened in the Great Leap forward, you know, Mao Zedong had them working away in the hills somewhere or that, digging a resource and they neglected the agriculture and as a result millions ended up starving to death. That's what happens when you do not go down the road and accept that of the division of labour. This is the very reason why private ownership of property is so important. You places know. have the best outcomes. Sweden, right. France, Germany, what places have the best and most efficient healthcare systems? We're, you know, bottom of the list in terms of developed countries. So, I, I mean... Even just by that basic metric, it could be debunked in two seconds. It's just the same tired old arguments on the healthcare, etc. And he's comparing the main American healthcare market to these countries. Why doesn't he try and compare direct primary care or just free market healthcare to that of those countries? Of course, he wouldn't do so. He wants to try and pass off the main American healthcare market as somehow being free market when it isn't. He? And I, I mean, I think, you know, to be fair, the guy is talking in the, in the 70s, 80s, and he's just had to look back and not understand that like oh my gosh 
uh, maybe uh, the success that we've been experiencing the post-World War II era has to do with the fact that, A, we destroyed a, a huge part of the, <laughs> of the world, and now we're spending uh, money to build, uh, build it back up, and we have uh, strong labor unions. And I don't know why he mentions that of the 70s, etc., because America was close to facing that of a second Great Depression. In the 1960s was a period of false prosperity, simply because of all the running the printing press, etc. They're creating a serious inflationary problem and whatnot. I don't think it helped matters when you've seen Nixon taking away the partial gold standard and then you've seen inflation just take off. It's just unbelievable. What Milton Friedman was basically arguing, what he was basically saying is that yes, such societies that moved away from capitalism have been a disaster. And I think the United States of America bloody well proves that bloody well point. <laughs> uh, a different year, I think, and did not have the the uh, benefit of the hindsight that we have now. Oh, and he's also talking in an era where there's so much more generalized access and prosperity for, you know, white men. And I mean, there's obviously, it's very right. racialized and there's no question about it, but you could go to college for basically free. So they don't understand the free stuff, folk. It's no free. It's actually more expensive. Just like the broken window fallacy, which is very similar. In the background, then things are being compensated. Placements end up getting cut. For example, here in Scotland, there was like 11 placements or something available for the university degree in photography. I didn't have any need to go and study because I graduated and it was enough for me at college. You're compensating by cutting back elsewhere. And even when it came down to that of the issue today with the higher tax rates and stuff like that, businesses are going to compensate. So they're going to raise the cost of their goods and services because they're producing less. And as a result, what does that pass off on to the consumer? So the poor end up getting hurt. They think it's free. Free at the point of use or something like that. It's just like this with the NHS. Well, how do you compensate in the NHS? How do you think you've got all the long waiting lines, etc. And the shortage of beds? And trust me, you're seeing that problem today. In fact, you've been seeing that problem for decades. And this is the problem because it's all as a result of these so-called free things that they keep going on about. So that's the basis of the argument, folk. He doesn't really understand the division of labour. He doesn't comprehend why we've got what we've got in terms of the private property rights and whatnot. Later on in other videos in response on Milton Friedman goes on about the regulation and stuff like that. You know he believes oh if it wasn't for government you wouldn't have roads and all the rest of this crap. Anyway folk if you've got anything you would like to add in comment in the comment section below. Thank you for watching the video. Be sure to like the video, share the video and I shall talk to you later. Cheers.